Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shett, episode 514, featuring an interview with one Wade Langer, a.k.a. Prof Noctus. That's right, a <laughs> fellow professor. <laughs> uh, Wade wrote his uh, dissertation uh, on the Judeo-Christian kingship in Final Fantasy XV. And he's got some really interesting takes on the connections between religion and uh, the Final Fantasy series and gaming and role-playing games in particular. Uh, JRPGs are his specialty. Uh, so we get into all that much, much more. I think you'll agree he's a very fascinating guy. And there's a reason he's so successful on Twitch and YouTube and all the other uh, venues where he uh, proliferates his content. Um, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here is Prof Noctis. Well, look who I'm here with, Prof Noctis. Wade, how you doing today? Hey, what's up? How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Really interested in have you on the show. You've got some unique stuff. I mean, just show people some of these things you've been working on. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, let's see. What first? Yeah, I think this will... Uh... Yeah, there you go. Here's your Twitch. I think this there is we your go. Twitch yeah. page. There it is. Final Fantasy stream. Then you've got a YouTube page. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> Divine War and Punishment. Yep. Mythos. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun with these videos. We're gonna have some, we're gonna have a lot to talk about. Yeah, these have been a blast. These have been a blast. And what else do you have? We got oh yeah, this is from your this is from uh, Religious Life at the University of Alabama, uh, where I, I serve as the director of the Wesley Foundation at the University of Alabama. That's the United Methodist Campus Ministry. Um, and I've worked with, um, I, I was the head of all of the Religious Life world in, um, in Bama, I guess. Uh, but yeah, this is kind of my staff page. <laughs> you did your research. That's good. I spent a lot of time at the Wesley at... Uh... <laughs> Northwestern State. Oh, did you really? Nice. Yeah, this is our whole staff. Uh, we played a lot of uh, Magic the Gathering there. <laughs> yep. people, we, we've got... Um, people really realize what goes on at a Wesley. That they really don't. We've got two small groups that are doing a Dungeons and Dragon campaign, and yeah. they're using that as their like small group, and so they're incorporating like their, their religious studies, Bible studies, book studies into uh, d d It's wild. <laughs> oh, I think I got one more thing I was going to show. Yeah, look at this. There we go. <laughs> oh, my dissertation. Oh, man. Oh, man. People always... I read this dissertation. I, we got some notes here. I'm going <laughs> to... No, I'm just kidding. But this yeah. is great. How'd you get away with this? Huh? Man, it was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> um, I was... I, I literally was was playing the video game and uh, just like an epiphany happened. I was like, I think I can turn this into something. And that's how it went. <laughs> Yeah, this is really cool. So you're talking here about how you're really interested in the kingships. Yeah. But you're using a... I guess, uh, you know, if I'm reading this, if I remember what I mm -hmm. <laughs> read just yesterday, <laughs> uh, there's certain parts of the Bible that a lot of people don't find very compelling. Yeah. But That's you found exactly. a way to uh, sort of bridge that gap with uh, Final Fantasy, which... That's some innovative thinking. That was <laughs> that was the funnest thing, man. Man, I like. I mean, we we can get into that story if you want. I mean, it's it's a fun one. It's a fun one. So <laughs> let's let's we'll go, we can do whatever you want let's to do. do. It. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was in, I was doing my my doctoral work, and um, I was actually doing a different dissertation, but just kind of beating my head against the wall, uh, IRB approval, all this kind of stuff. And it just was not clicking. Meanwhile, I'm playing Final Fantasy 15. It's just released. And um, I, I played through it uh, the first time. And are, are you familiar with 15? Now you've got the background and I love the background. Yeah, I'm just uh, a poser. I'm just a poser. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm playing. I, did, I went down a deep rabbit hole of Final Fantasy prepping yeah. for this interview, but yeah. Oh man, well I, I I'm playing Final Fantasy 15, and um it's it's pretty standard fare. Um all the way uh until you know a few chapters in, I I begin to think there are some 
really interesting similarities between this and some of my own research, but that's not particularly weird. You know, mythologies, religions, that's always in Final Fantasy and in JRPGs in general. So, but I keep going and I remember the moment. I'm literally playing on my couch, with a controller in my hand, and something happens in chapter 13, which is largely reviled as the worst chapter in the entire game. For me, I was like hooked. And something happens narratively where I like point at it and I'm like, this is the same story as King Saul and King David. And so I literally go run to my bookshelf, grab a Bible, hold it open, and I'm reading and then I'm playing and I've got a controller and a Bible in my hand. And I just have this idea. I was like, this is like one of the most boring parts of the Bible for my students. I think that I can turn this into something. And turned into a small group after that, uh, a focus group pilot test. And uh, then the university said, do you have any classes you would like to pitch? I pitched this one and they were like, that's absolutely insane. We love it. Uh, and they let me do it. And then they've let me keep doing it every semester. Um, just insane. Insane. That is fantastic. I love that image of a controller in one <laughs> hand, Bible in the other. I mean, <laughs> you're not going to hear that on many other youtube channels today. you're not i mean it's, it's one of the most unorthodox <laughs> sort of methods but it, it's been amazing absolutely amazing so <laughs> yeah i think back to a lot of the pastors i grew up with they i don't know if i ever had any they that were just opposed to video games and yeah that, but, you know they didn't ever seem like i don't think any of them ever made that connection to this might actually be a way to bring people in yeah. Well, I tell people, you know, I, I've known Mario longer than I knew Jesus. So <laughs> um, he, he was my origin story in a lot of ways. So I guess your gaming started with the Nintendo? and Yeah, the regular Nintendo when my dad brought home the yeah. regular Nintendo Entertainment System. And I was hooked ever since. Um, some of my earliest memories were my dad... Um, I, I was still young. I, I could barely read. And so we were playing Super Nintendo at this point. So I'd kind of gotten my my basics. But we're playing Final Fantasy IV, of all things. I rented it from Blockbuster Video on Friday night. And so we were playing I mean, through the week. He's renting video games. Right. <laughs> wow, that's a nostalgia trip. It is. It is. So I, I picked up Final Fantasy II, I guess, for the, the Super Nintendo. And I was like, hey, let's play this one. I'm sitting in his lap. He's helping me sound out words and stuff like Leviathan and Bahamut, Behemoth, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, that that hooked me into Final Fantasy. But I I got my chops on uh, Mario, I guess, Mario and Zelda, in the earliest days. Oh, great stuff. So let's see, you've got some upcoming projects. You've got your Final Fantasy 16 lecture streams on philosophy of religion. Yeah. We we'll have to draw this out a little bit more here about the, these connections between the games and the Please. and the religious stuff. But yeah, you, you just got some yeah Final Fantasy VII remakes lectures on perspectives of death and life cycles. You know, you're really doing some interesting work here. <laughs> you know, you you remind me a lot of uh, what I've read of uh, Richard Garriott. You know, when he was doing a, I don't know how familiar you are with the mildly, open. yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was just thinking, this is sort of you know, I remember reading him. I uh, reading some about his uh, when he was designing the Ultima series, and he'd get letters mm -hmm. from parents about, "Hey, we're kind of worried about the influence of the all the killing and so on in these games." So he yeah. he really took that to heart. Did a bunch of sounds like a religious, maybe I don't know if it's how much of it was Christian, <laughs> but yeah, you know, exploring religious and uh, religions and philosophies and created that whole uh, virtue system. And yeah, you know, the idea his idea was if you play the Ultima series his goal was to make you into a better person, you know, exactly. better. Uh, do you see something similar? Well, uh, yeah. And that's, that was really kind of the crux of my dissertation. Um, so uh, ostensibly my dissertation was all about, you know, how do you use a video game to teach this kind of boring part of the Bible, but below the surface, you're going to bring in um, educational theorists like Piaget, Dewey and others whose mm -hmm. primary focus was if we can get them interested in, this content through gamification, then it's going to manifest in some way and it's going to direct behavior. Um, if De Dewey constantly says that the goal of education is not more knowledge, but it is um, in many ways behavior, um, you know, assimilation. It, it's to really impact someone's mm -hmm. behavior from that moment on. And so that's exactly kind of my thinking. Um, Final Fantasy, JRPGs in general, there, there's 
oftentimes been a rift, uh, maybe not so much in the, the last decades or so, but like, I remember in the eighties and the nineties, there was almost like, what was it? Um, it wasn't like mothers against drunk, drunk driving, but it was oh, like mothers that's... against D and D and stuff like that. Um, it, it was things crying. like that. Right. And, um, for me, I always loved these games and I, I was like, I'm getting incredible messages from these games, like these narrative story driven games. And so for me, I knew how compelling these stories were. I knew the messages behind these games. And then my question was, how can I utilize this in an educational component so that students, you know, have better self-esteem, more confidence, uh, more ambition in some ways. Um, and, and behold, this is kind of what happened. Um, so all they ever hear from the maybe i don't know what their family life is like but yeah. it's not like the mainstream media whatever you want to use that term always every time there's a topic about video games yeah always kind of oh here it comes <laughs> you know and at best it's oh the kids are wasting so many hours you know playing these games and it's, yeah. it's, it's almost you know what are you trying to tell uh, people that their favorite things are like they're just wasting time with those i mean what kind of impact can that have on a kid's self-esteem here in that message yeah. over and over yeah and I, I mean you talk to these students and i mean as, as a gamer i know this like you create formative memories and not just um not just with other people through multiplayer but you have formative memories of living out a story living out situations that are building confidence in you um i i, I think that's why there was a trope um, in the um, like around 97 through maybe the early 2000s where you would have this kind of a lone stoic protagonist um, in a lot of these narrative driven games. I again think of Final Fantasy, but I think um, that th there were there were some other games like uh, Metal Gear Solid in some ways that would have this kind of strong stoic pro protagonist whose narrative begins to un unpack him in some ways and i remember playing that as a teenager i think particularly playing a solid snake seeing some similarities like i i'll never you know uh, infiltrate a base but some of these narrative tropes are universal to my experience and to, to many others and i think it helps you to think more deeply in fact that was one of the most interesting things about my research um it's the idea that gaming versus reading or even watching a movie or something like that because you have agency it's creating first person memories and experiences in you that that way when you actually recall talk to a five-year-old who's playing mario he doesn't say um mario saved the princess he says i saved the princess exactly. i jumped over and, it, and so there's this is just like a simple way of saying these are first person memories where they remember what it felt like um in in an amazing way um so when we're able to kind of channel that first person memory making into something um, positive, confidence building, esteem boosting. Boy, you have something that's a lifelong thing. I, and I think that's the coolest thing in the world. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I remember <laughs> like the Might and Magic series. I remember playing those a lot uh, yeah. growing up. And if you beat one, it would let you download or uh, it would let you, how did this work exactly? But it would let you print out basically a certificate <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now I'd often joke about it. I, I was prouder of those than I was my uh, uh, master's degree in my. Oh, <laughs> you know? absolutely. absolutely. I mean, I probably put more work into getting through those some of those games. And I felt that way about Dark Souls. Oh, I wish I had a certificate for that one the first time. <laughs> yeah, well, in all games, I hey, hang this on the wall, right? Uh, now we get platinum trophies. I guess that works. So. <laughs> yeah, I think it's come back to Gary again. I follow him on Twitter. Yeah, he, uh, in the end of the Ultimate Games, he would have a line in there, I guess, about if you completed this game, write me, you know, and let me know how it went, something like that. Oh, that's so cool! So, still, he still gets those. That's awesome. You know, that's awesome. On Twitter, all the time, you know, he'll be somebody will send him the, the screenshot, you know, by now. <laughs> I, I don't know that. if the email address still works, but but yeah, a real sense of accomplishment. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I notice this a lot too. I got a, uh, I'm mostly a writing professor. Hmm focus mostly on uh, on writing uh, but i have a class called understanding video games oh nice <laughs> uh, so the students a lot of them are writing about uh, their favorite games or games yeah. recovery class and they're like this is the first time i've ever enjoyed a writing class mm. <laughs> and cool. just you know i finally get to write about this thing that you know has been such a huge part of my life and you know they have a great time what do you use in that class? Do you have specific texts or is it uh, writing prompts or what, what do you use? Uh, 
I had a book. Um, what was the name of that book? We got one called Understanding Video Games, mm. which is also the name of the course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the method for writing is they they call it player response. Okay. Kind of based on reader response. So it's really kind of like what you're saying. It's oh, not I try to, it's it's a little hard to explain it, uh, even for me, but it's not like we're not writing a game review. We're not just writing a synopsis yeah. of a game. We want to uh write about your experience playing that game. You know, what okay. decisions did you make? Why did you go this way and that way? Uh, and then I try to get them to reflect on that. I mean, ultimately, it's what did you learn about yourself? Yeah. You know, more so than just about the game. So, <laughs> yeah, that's to make those breakthroughs. And again, it's yeah. it's really uh, it's awesome to read these things because you can see the the epiphanies happening. And, you know, yeah, that's that's one of the things that I have tried to incorporate. I'm really interested in this book. I just Googled it. And uh, man, like, I mean, you're 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 building my Christmas list right now. I can just build my, <laughs> nothing like a new textbook for Christmas, you know? Yeah, the player response when there's I have to get the name of the player book response. for you, but it's a different book. But okay, it was uh, somebody's uh, dissertation work. Oh man, I kind of quickly wrapped it up into a, into a book, but it's really good. I don't, I don't want to necessarily want to assign it to the students because it's really more I think useful for teachers. I think. Yeah, yeah, oh, and I can get that. Um, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. In my class um, on Final Fantasy, I, I'm going to be teaching that one again in the, the spring. Um, Judeo-Christian kingship through Final Fantasy 15. And um, the way that I do it is I, I have to give them like a basis of um, kind of the core content the first month. And so we do a, a four week, way too fast deep dive into um, the biblical, uh, the Hebrew Bible from Genesis all the way to, to Malachi, uh, just on the precipice of um, New Testament messianic texts. And um, so they, we do that in eight classes. It's awful. Um, but then after that, you, I, I tell them, you get to play a video game the rest of the time. It's going to be great. So just get through this month. But then during the video game session, I have them keep a series of journals. And then they have four reflection papers they have to write that correspond with what's going on with Noctis, who's the main character in 15, um, that correspond with where he is on his journey. And then one of the coolest things that, that we do, I, I again, it, it, if you've never played 15 all the way to the end, then this is going to sound like, what is this game? But there's a, um, there's a series of campfires that you do where you're camping out with your friends and uh, kind of a neat thing. But there's a final campfire where everybody's kind of sitting around the campfire and they're talking about, you know, what's happening and like this kind of trauma they're experiencing. And there's a moment in the end of the game where the main character Noctis has to choose a photograph to take with him as a memory. So what I do in my final session with the class um it's a smaller class about 20 people or so i have them all over to the house and um i i make dinner for them and then we have a uh, um a bonfire in the backyard um where we all kind of sit around and they have to bring a photo of something that corresponds with their journey like knox's journey and then they you know it's all for bonus points it's not required or whatever but um they share their story around the fire this living into the game is one of the coolest things that I've ever done as a teacher or anything like that. Um, but it's really like this meaningful moment. Even my, my favorite thing is when my, uh, my Kyos or my AOPI uh, sorority girls are sitting in the class and they're just sobbing over this. Like, I never thought a video game would do this to me. It's like, yeah, that, that's, it's amazing. You know, was, was in your dissertation or somewhere else where you're talking about some, sometimes you get students that are, they just show up because they hear, I think it was a workshop or some uh, yeah. extracurricular stuff you were doing, but they just were like, oh, something Final Fantasy, right? And then really, they come for that. Yeah. But then they get interested in all the other stuff. And... They do. I, you know, it's it's been amazing because some people, there's like three different types of people that take my class. Um, there's the gamers who are like, I've heard of Final Fantasy or I like Final Fantasy. Then there's the religious students. And they're like, oh, Judeo-Christian kingship. That's not something I know much about. I want to learn more about this. Um, and then you get the ones that just look for a humanities or writing credit. <laughs> and they're my favorite. They're the, they're the ones that don't know what's about to hit them. <laughs> they're just like, I'm here. You're playing a video game. What is this? <laughs> I got the same sort. Well, this I took it sounded like an easy class, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it is easy if you come to class. Um, <laughs> if you don't come to class, boy, you're going to be real lost. Yeah. 
Now let's see what where do we now you're gonna do a book. Yeah, I'm trying to I, I am working continually on this Final Fantasy uh 15 book. So the the reality is with my dissertation, if you looked at it even for a second, then you're like, this is not for just like normal lay lay yeah. people, I guess. Like it's it's a especially around chapter um four, it's very research based. Um, you're really getting into numbers. Um some some stuff that's just not very accessible and approachable to to most people and most people just kind of want um you know the curriculum well the curriculum for this like comparison is not in the dissertation um it, it's more the effects and the impacts of the uh the dissertation um so what what uh my dissertation advisor said to me he said, that's the, the, the book that comes out of this. This is just the, the metrics, the research, all that kind of stuff with the, the background. This is what makes you, quote, an expert in the field. The book comes later. And so that's like what I'm working on now. He's a great one. Oh, he was amazing. Um, he was also amazing because he's not religious. <laughs> he was not religious at all. And he was like, I don't really understand this don't give me fluff, give me like real stuff. And I'm like, oh man, that's so good. That's so I needed that. I needed that. Yeah. Maybe we could talk a little bit of, just about Judah, Judeo Christian kingship. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what is it about that? That is, has sort of sucked you in. So um, it's a passion of yours. I know from, Oh, it's a major passion of mine. Uh, uh, almost. Um, almost a, an Achilles heel. If somebody starts talking about it, I'm like, oh, let's do this. Um, because it changed my whole framework. This dissertation changed my framework of how I read not only the Hebrew scriptures, but the, the Christian scriptures as well. Because I began to realize that the thrust of the Bible like, is a kingship narrative. Um, and it's a specific type of kingship. Um, and while I was interested in stories of kings like King Arthur and European kings, things like that, this story is a very different one in that it's sacral kingship. It is sacred, holy, um, uh, theocratic kingship in some ways. And so I, I found that always compelling since I was about 14 years old, just because I was like, oh, it's the Bible's version of these stories that I like. Um but the more that I researched it and the more that I began to, to get into it, I began to notice there were kind of four components that were um, universal to all the kings in, in, the, um, in the kingship narratives of the, the Bible and in Mesopotamia and Babylon. And they kind of follow in some ways um, Campbell's The Hero's Journey. You're familiar with The Hero's Journey? Oh. I, I mean, like everybody. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. my. I, I mean, if you've watched a movie, you know, Campbell's journey, right? And so, but it is this idea of there are trials that are going to um, test the heart and improve the heart of a king, as well as increase their influence. Um, it, it improves or increases their reputation. Um, and then you have specific relationships of a king that um, that um, kind of found the king's reign. You have to have an advisor. You have to have a best friend of some kinds, a, a, a peer, confidant. Um, you need to have a protector. This is usually a general um, or, or a captain in your guard. And then finally, um, in, in the sacred traditions, you're going to have a prophet, somebody that is the go-between between the divine and the king. This creates a bit of a um, distinction between mm -hmm. um, this delineation of power. Right. Um, so that the king isn't all powerful, but is subject to somebody. So trials and relationships. But then there's a moment of responsibility where the king has to, to move from um, kind of their own ascension into kingship to and receiving to giving. It's these people are my responsibility or this task, this war, whatever it is, is my responsibility. And ultimately that culminates in what I call a deliverance of order to chaos. Now that is straight from the Mesopotamian um, myths and religion. It's the idea that the world is chaos and a divine a deity or a representative of the deity is going to bring order to chaos. And one of the things that I talk about is that this idea of image of God, which isn't just um, Jewish or Christian, it is um, it, it's rife in, in all of the ancient Near Eastern traditions that humanity bears the image of God. And how do they bear the image of God? It's not physicality. 
Instead, it is um, these attributes of the divine. So if God is just, then humanity must act in justice. If God is loving, if God has wrath, if God has regret, then humans emote these things, but there's a proper, um, holy, sacred way of doing it. So they bring order to chaos through these divine attributes. So these four pieces, um, trials, relationships, responsibility, and order. Um, this, this is the way that I began to understand these, these pieces. And I fell in love with this story. Um, it's a lather, rinse, repeat for the 38 some odd Kings in, um, in, in the, um, the Jewish Bible. Right. Um, but then the question that I had was if Jesus in the new Testament is called the King of Kings, then it stands to reason that he would follow this same archetype. And mm -hmm. then he would do it perfectly, right? If he's the king of all the kings, then he succeeds where they fail. Um, and so this idea of Messiah began to take on less of a kind of spiritual sort of, you know, thing. And it became more of a practically, he is following this ascension story paradigm, and he's doing it in a way that redeems the past um, of, of failed leaders and kings. And uh, ultimately, that that is where my dissertation landed. It was like, this is a way of teaching the entire story um, from from beginning to end. And uh, so that's that's why I'm super passionate about it. And uh, yeah, um, students, students are mildly interested in it, but the game really kind of turns it up to 11. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> uh, I remember you said that you, um, for you, Lord of the Rings was more about Aragorn than <laughs> yeah that's that is definitely my my take on that one um or at least i always leaned into it <laughs> and that's in some of your a lot of your videos you bring in some you know some aspects that i don't think you would find on most other you know, okay gamer channels like i remember <laughs> i saw a video one of yours you're talking about on ontology oh yeah that's the um, what it's well, i don't think i've ever heard the word ontology <laughs> in one of these videos but <laughs> I don't know how how close to the Final Fantasy community you get, but they're fighting all the time. These oh, are these, these are professional fighters, and uh, they get online and they um, argue. And there was an argument about what is Final Fantasy, and I was like, "So I have a lecture in my class, you know, especially for the sorority girls and the non gamers. That's like, what is Final Fantasy? So I adapted that into this fifteen minute thing. It's like we got to talk about ontology. What is ontology, and how to how can we use that to understand this game series <laughs> like properties and elements elements yeah and that that's a very simplistic like 101 understanding of ontology but i was like this is this is really helpful because you know what is the difference between a core element and something that's an inter interchangeable property oh, yeah. for something and um you know everybody's like well no final fantasy is turn-based and others like well no it's action now and it's like well um that's an interchangeable property, but the bigger idea is that there's an element of a um, customizable battle system. And uh, the way that you live in that uh, can be properties. And then you've got different characters that are properties, but not necessarily elements. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I ran into that uh, same sort of problem when I was writing my books. And of course, everybody wants to know, how do you define computer role-playing game? Sure. I mean, what? How would you define that? What? what? <laughs> Yeah. Let's talk. We have to talk about ontology. <laughs> I, don't know, I just kind of say, I mean, I ultimately just have to fall back on the, well, you know, it when you see it, you know, mm -hmm. I, I do tend to think it has to have some kind of statistical basis to the leveling and the, and the yeah. combat. If, you know, games, that if it doesn't have that, so if there's no way to level up, you know, I say, well, hmm. <laughs> but then yeah. you get into this whole thing about, well, what if like with the action comes up a lot in my book too, uh, so some you play a game like Skyrim or Dark Souls, you know, I'd say mm -hmm. those are very you have to have a certain agility with a controller that is totally irrelevant in wizardry or uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. all these are earlier games where it's pretty much strategy and tactics. But uh, so it's, it kind of seems more like a continuum to me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you played what's your Bald take? <laughs> have you played Baldur's the... Gate 3? Oh, of course. Yeah. I love OK, it. so I've not played it. I've not played it yet. Um, it's on my backlog. I think that Christmas break is going to be the time that I do that. Um, so like I, I was never 
much into D and D, right? Like that, that wasn't, um, like I, I always did like console video games and never did tabletop games and stuff. So in your experience with computer RPGs and with Baldur's Gate, how should I, as a traditionally console JRPG gamer, approach this? Because I'm I'm pretty wary. I'm like, I don't know if this is for me, but I love story. So, uh, yeah, I think just about anybody could just enjoy Baldur's Gate three. Okay, you, you don't necessarily have to play the first two. I love the first two. Okay, do they connect? Is it like a story that it's connects to the first? Not the same. Uh, some of the same characters and things. Oh, uh, okay. Stuff. But I don't. I think you don't necessarily have to play those That's earlier. Not necessary. Okay. Uh, yeah. Although at some point you probably should. <laughs> no. I mean, you kind of have like the mirror, you're like the mirror image of me because you know, I'm the so op, I, I know so little about GRPGs. Oh, uh, okay. I, I, when I was uh, you know, writing these books, of course you have to talk about it because there's no denying that uh, Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, you know, all the rest, uh, Zelda for that matter. Yeah. You know, they have uh, such a huge, I mean, at first the influence is from west to east, right? So they're playing Wizardry and Ultima mm -hmm. and we could do a game like this, but then then that sort of shifts, and now the influence is coming back the other way because mm -hmm. uh, these series are so much more popular <laughs> in both uh, both countries, right? Than yeah, these other ones before. So I felt like I had to talk about it, but I always, um, you know, I don't know Japanese. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know very little. Never been to Japan. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I always feel kind of at a loss, you know, and plus not having grown up playing. Uh, console rpgs i've gone back and played you know just for uh completion or just to feel like i have something to say you know i played all the way through the first final fantasy and yeah you know, the more popular ones and i need i've always been uh i need to go back and finish seven okay yeah. the, the original the, or remake yeah i heard that's the well i don't know i shouldn't be asking you you this is yeah what what should, i should yeah. put that question to you you know so somebody I, who uh yeah. Sort of, has sort of dabbled in Final Fantasy. I mean, what, dabbled. What you... So I'll say this. I've played Final Fantasy VII at least once a year since 1997. Like, I love Final Fantasy VII. I can't say that it's my favorite um, because 15 took off. I mean, it changed my life, right? But seven is like, um, it's, it's up there for me. But what they're doing with Remake is fascinating and uh so like everybody in the final fantasy community kind of fights about this um and there's the uh there's the group that's like you have to play the original to understand remake and they're very much in the like this is a sequel territory but i'm doing a it's a very unofficial non-approved um research project where i am telling a few of my students i'm like hey i want you to just play the remake and play through the trilogy avoid the original because i'm just curious about their take on it um like do they understand the story now i have a thesis that the remake trilogy is going to become the definitive telling of the final fantasy 7 story without need of the original it's not going to make it obsolete necessarily it's always going to be there but you're going to it's going to have a self-contained story which i think is going to be really good so my suggestion is if you love and have a tolerance for um uh, role-playing games that came out in 1997 you're gonna love it um but if you don't then go remake and don't look back i would say <laughs> go remake and don't look back <laughs> and that's, that's that will get me absolutely obliterated if <laughs> anybody from the community sees that <laughs> aren't there like certain versions where there's extra dungeons extra content and then they get removed in other versions and yeah um so i, I seven... would hate to have to untangle all that you really don't. I, I mean, the the seven that is available to everyone now is what's called the international version. So this was back in the days when Japan would get their video games about between three to nine months before America would. And so during that extra time, they would oftentimes add in extra cutscenes, maybe some extra dungeons. But mm -hmm. ultimately that, and especially with seven, that became the definitive version. Um, and so it's just re-release in Japan. So now it's just one version, Final Fantasy VII. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I'll take your advice. Maybe I'll just try the remake. And, yeah. You know, if sometimes it often really gets you curious. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of role playing, computer role playing games, the same sort of deal. You know, do you want to play the modern version yeah. or you want to seek out the, or, the original? And, 
<laughs> well, they are. And then you get in these like, what is authenticity? What what is Man. this discussion even about anymore? You know, you can't well, go back remake, in time. The remake is interesting because it tells the story of the original, but it adds so much. I mean, one line of dialogue becomes a sixty minute chapter in in remake. Um, a, a a a screenshot of a dungeon that was only like one screen big becomes a, a fully formed tower and, and things. It's just expanded. Um, and, and that's why I say it really is the definitive version of the, the story of this. And you're not going to get that. The, the original is fast paced. You can beat the whole game in 20, 25 hours. Um, whereas remake, it's going to take about 30 hours to beat. And it's only the first tenth of the story of the game. Uh, of the original game. So, yeah, I mean, it's broken into a trilogy um, and they've really expanded it. So, I would love to know your thoughts on it, though, yeah. if you play it. <laughs> I mean, you say the community's fighting. I mean, what are we talking about? <laughs> a gentlemanly disagreement? or is this... mm, It depends on who you're talking about, uh, uh, talking to. Um, on Twitter, <laughs> you know... Oh, we're not going to get flooded in... with hate mail. Or... <laughs> you're not. Engagement. Uh, in- engagement usually depends on controversy right and so people people say inflammatory things and people other people chime in honestly the biggest controversy in final fantasy 7 um discourse is who um who do you uh put in a relationship um you've got this kind of triangle love triangle and there's groups that are like the main character goes with this guy. The main character goes with this one or this girl. I, I mean, it's it's wild. Um, they they Wait, fight. I think we froze for about a minute there, or thirty seconds. Oh, I froze. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, I think it's on my end. Oh, I I don't know. I don't but know. You just said uh, the biggest controversy is it's about shipping and who do you shipping. put in a relationship? Um, Cloud, the main t- character, and Aerith or Tifa. And these are the two pr- primary female protagonists and uh, people fight like to the death about this one. I mean, it is, I've never seen such passionate people. Which I'm like, one to choose or... which one to choose. And uh, I mean, I never thought that the game was about that personally, but uh, you know, people really, really are into it. And it's like, okay, that's good with the discourse. Yes. Engagement is engagement. Yeah. No, no, I guess I'm, you know, I always try to keep in mind that not everybody's like me, and yeah. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of players will have a completely different experience. I mean, that's yeah. one of the reasons why those player response essays are kind of fun. Yeah, <laughs> like, wow, I didn't even pay attention to this part of the game, and you well, know, for yeah. this person, this was like yeah. the biggest thing. And it's it's not like say Persona or even Baldur's Gate, where you know you're you're you've got relationship points, and you can um, you can end up with somebody. Um, it, it's not that kind of game. There's one date where that kind of takes into account, but um, largely the game is about life and death cycles, and it's not about love very much. I think with Baldur's Gate 3, I probably reloaded more due to a, something I said in a dialogue. Okay. <laughs> like, oh no, I've ruined this friendship or this, you know, relationship. Yeah. I did so that are, more than I did with the combat, you know? I probably are you still. <laughs> are you an advocate of save scumming then like saving those files and reloading yeah that's probably how i'd play too i mean i some people are like purists know what is written is written it's like, oh, okay. oh, no. <laughs> no it's you know it's it's, it's just gonna bug me the whole time yeah yeah right. that a lot of games that you know have the iron man mode and mm-hmm. Whatever your, your decisions are final, your decisions should matter. Now we're getting into like classic game narrative <laughs> discussions. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's often pointed out, well, games will never be a serious storytelling medium cool. uh, because you can just, it's not a good story if you can just save scum and reload and choose yeah. a different yeah. option, right? You have to, you have to, it has to be that inevitability of uh, the tragedy or whatever. Mm. And you know, Final Fantasy is good ex- or Seven's good example of that, right? No matter what you do, there's going to be a a moment in there. <laughs> well, yeah, it's very linear um, throughout. I mean, you're heading toward these these key moments. But do you like my understanding of Baldur's Gate Three is that it is it, you have agency. Anything can happen. You can kill certain characters, let them live, and all that stuff. Do you find that that um, worsens the story in some way that it doesn't have the narrative. No, I don't. I've never agreed with that. You know. Assessment. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, 
Yeah, I feel like it's a, my story, and I'm, I want to have as much power over it mm-hmm. you know, as I can as a player. And I sometimes I disagree with certain designers that feel like, the, you know, they want the designer that should be the, yeah. the god, you know. Yeah. Um, same thing with Dungeons and Dragons, right? You want the DM who's <laughs> no, this is <laughs> this. That's not how I envision this. A magic force compels you, you know. <laughs> yeah. Or, or do you want somebody that's kind of reacting to the party and yeah. you know, going whichever way they want? And then, you know, I get that there's there's arguments to be made. You know, yeah. if, if I was playing with Gary Gygax, <laughs> I'd be like, look, you, uh, yeah, your way is fine. You know, I want to. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about what I want, but uh, ordinarily it should be at least a shared uh, experience. Yeah, this is a conversation that we kind of get into in my classes because there there is oftentimes a critique of um, of Final Fantasy fifteen, particularly in my class, uh, where they're like, "I'm not sure why they did made this choice narrative. Like, why why did they they do that? Even after we beat the game, it's like I'm not sure why they did this." And So one of the questions that we run across is um, how much, um, I I guess when you're critiquing a game, do you critique it against what you wish it was or do you critique it against what they're trying to do, what the developer is trying to do? And is there a conversation Mm -hmm. there? I I think that it's a question of art and um, just that that whole creating. Yeah. I mean, it'd be like, I I really hate the, yeah, for some reason I'm thinking of Peter Jackson movies and the, mm. the, the, no, there's no Tom Bambadil. <laughs> right, right. I, that's a great no, example. No, who cares? There's no Tom Bam. Bam. Yeah. Oh, you know, you know, you probably talk to people that that for them was a deal breaker. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I I understand their their argument there. Mm-hmm. You know, what if? Uh, Shakespeare plays, you know, the big points and during the productions were like, okay, let's do a quick poll, you know, to see should yeah, you know, what should happen to Hamlet here. <laughs> right, right. Uh, okay, that wouldn't work. Right. <laughs> but, but uh I don't know, is it just the games are different mm. than those other formats? Or because I, I think we could come back to that first thing you're talking about with your your students, and they, they don't say Mario save the princess or it's mm-hmm. i save the princess you the more you the designer kind of forces them uh, forces their hand the less of that i there is yeah and eventually it is you know well mario <laughs> if you watch the yeah. movie <laughs> yeah uh you don't say well that was me on the screen and i i do wonder if that if the um release of this movie is going to in some ways impact the way that kids do hmm. this um, because I, I mean, that suddenly becomes a third person sort of understanding of like, that's Mario. Now I'm playing as Mario instead of like an avatar for myself. Um, and this goes into the conversation about, um, should Link speak in the legend of Zelda where mm-hmm. Nintendo has always been like pretty adamant, like, no, Link is the player and like, we're not going to make him speak. Your response is his response. And I, I'm like, okay, I kind of respect that in some ways. It does dampen the narrative in, in some ways because, you know, it's just you, the silent protagonist. But it makes me wonder, like playing through Spider-Man 2 right now, I, I'm thinking about kids playing this. Are they playing as Spider-Man going through the story or, or are they Spy- Spider-Man, if that makes sense? Oh, I, yeah, um, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, and, and I wonder, I wonder if that is going to have some impact on a person's first person memory making. I, I'm sure it does. I just don't know the science behind that one. Yeah, it's probably similar, like with the people that read Harry Potter mm-hmm. and then versus the people that have only seen the movies. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a difference. Uh, what do you call it? The self-made memory or what was that phrase? You it used? Is, I, I call it first person memory making. First um, person memory. Yeah. Because it's first person perspective memory making. I like that first person memory making. Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking notes. <laughs> I feel like it only feels appropriate, you know, talking to a professor. I mean, that's that's right. I've I'm I listen, I'm building a biography, a bibliography from uh what you're saying. So. <laughs> and one thing I've, I've been kind of curious about, because one of the things I've kind of again, I feel kind of an insecurity about covering GRPGs just because again, I don't know, I feel like it's very different culture very different and the language barriers and all these things have you noticed uh 
in your work, did, did you feel like, well, there's some, lots of this I just want to understand because of the of the cultural uh, variation? Or it seems more like you're more like, well, there's no these there's all these universal mm-hmm. patterns and and you know the the hero with a thousand journeys is applicable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, here so maybe that's really not such a big concern i should have and i should just jump in yeah i I know i think that all of them are approachable and accessible and i think that you can go as deep as you want to now some jrpgs i don't think final fantasy does this very much but some jrpgs are going to lean heavily into japanese culture so for example the persona series there is a level of just understanding because you're working, uh, you're playing as a high schooler in Japan. So it's like, okay, what is Japan culture? Like when I was 12, 13 years old, I would never have hopped on a subway and gone to school, right? Like just a different world. Um, you know, where's the the parents? What's a like boarding school is much more, you know. So there are cultural pieces, but you're able to catch up pretty quickly. Okay. Well, and I think I think that's a tremendous job done by the localization teams um, to really help bridge those gaps. But you can go as deep as you want to in some of this stuff. For example, um, there is a trope in JRPGs um, where <laughs> that's why it's kind of a, a joke that I, I do what I do. It, the trope is that at the end, you're going to fight God. Or you're going to fight the divine. I mean, it is like you you against the deity. Wow. And so um, my question is, why is that a trope in JRPGs? Why does somebody, like, why is this so common? And um, so I did a little bit of research. One of my students actually um, dug into this a little bit and helped me think through some of these things, pulling together a lot of different resources. Mm-hmm. And um, our thesis from this, and it, it's rooted in just all, all kinds of stuff, especially with Neon Genesis Evangelion, um, that the anime, um, it's the idea that post-World War II, there was an influx of um, evangelical Christianity that moved into um, the East, in, into Japan predominantly. And their method of um, conversion was very, very, as you can imagine, evangelical. So a lot of um, Jesus died for your sins, turn to him or, you know, hell, destruction, that sort of thing. And so what we began to see was that sort of um, rigidity of belief um, rubbed against some Japanese sensibilities. And so there began to be some narratives of like, we have this very predestination, fate, Calvinistic God who is trying to control humanity in J- J- um, Japanese culture is very, was very much like, no, 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 we are the authors of our fate, um, you know, captains of our own ships, so that sort of thing um, to a degree. And so there's this, this battle that ensues, ens- ensues. So fiction writers and game developers began to take that and say, what happens when a group of people stand up against this kind of authoritarian divinity? And so, it could be a um, psychological response to some of those things in their history, which I think is fascinating from a historical perspective. Yeah, Carl Jung would have a good time. Oh, a blast, right? <laughs> like that's. <laughs> yeah, I definitely want to read. I have to read this book. It's and hopefully you'll. I guess you'll have a, no. No one will be out, but I'll keep an eye. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm still working on it. Um, the uh, the spring semester of my classes are going to serve as uh, like first readers. For yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm sitting here. The wheels are sort of turning in my head about what you're you're saying there. But I think that's mm-hmm. you know more I think about it, that makes a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. You know, it does kind of get it. You know, if if you tried to compare the CRPGs with the JRPGs, I think this is something now that I would put into the discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because you know, I don't know, you really see that. You, know, you get the CRPGs, what you you kill the evil wizard, you kill the dragon. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. In in my experience with CRPGs, there is kind of an evil that's a threat to the society um, or to the community, rather than a malevolent deity. Sometimes there is, but like I, I think of, um, and maybe that's more of a Western RPG thing instead of a CRPG thing that I'm thinking about, but. In my experience, that's been the one of the biggest differences. As I was doing my research for this, I was looking at all these uh, histories of Final Fantasy. There's some really good videos out there, by the way. Yeah, I like to some. Your yours are lengthy. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, but I remember one that it was kind of he was kind of hammering on the point of you know in the eighties there were all these uh, Japanese games coming to North America, but mm-hmm. they were all these action games yeah. because they thought that these would be easy to localize. It was very little dialogue, whereas the Dragon Quest and the later, of course, Final Fantasies, you got all this dialogue to work with. And I guess they had to. They were, yeah, Matt Bradley, sure, you had a question along the same lines here, but it was they, they took, yeah, many of the earlier Final Fantasy games censored religious references. Yeah. This is what, uh, yeah maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I have no clue no. <laughs> what, what's, what he's talking about there. Uh, did that take away from the overall experience? I said, maybe we could unpack that a little bit. So what were these religious references that were censored? So they were censored for the North American audience? Mm-hmm. They, they, uh, and they, I, I'm That's not sure if they were done. censored in the East, but um, I know that in America, for uh-huh. example, there was a specific spell that was called Holy. And it was supposed to be a very holy magic spell. Um, but in Final Fantasy um, 4, it was translated as white. And it was just like white orbs that kind of attacked the thing. Um, and I always thought that that was really, really strange. I was like, I've never heard of white being a spell or whatever. I was I was 10 years old, so I didn't really know anything. Um, but yeah, you think then, white was more controversial than holy then? <laughs> <laughs> right right oh I, yeah i mean what a, what a difference a few decades would make but um the uh the um when was it final fantasy 7 i think it was 7 they began to use holy language mm-hmm. and uh i remember being like what in the world like what what happened to white that was the most powerful spell <laughs> um but yeah that that was a a key censorship narratively there wasn't a lot of censorship in my recollection like i'm trying i'm racking my brain trying to think through um because you still had like the term paladin, um, which is a holy knight, right? You had, um, there were not many overt references to Christianity or religion, just mythological illusions. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Zelda did some um, some big censorship. Um, there's actually some, <laughs> let's see if I can find it. There's actually some, um, um, key images um, of Link from the Legend of Zelda praying like in a chapel to Jesus. Let me see if I can put this in a chat or something with you um, or share a link. The co-host. There it is. Um, screen. And you can, you oh, can just gosh. do whatever you need with that photo. But I mean, it's stunning. It's like, where did this image come from? So like, this was something that was utilized, um, but obviously doesn't go into the the game or anything like that. I I find it to be a bonkers image. Yeah, is there any way you can just share that on your side? Because I... I have no idea, but we're gonna try. Um, let's see. Can I open the? Phone? Yeah, let's try this. Here it is. Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you well, see, what's, that seemed like that would please. Uh christians to see this i mean what's the i mean yeah but i i it's also like what is happening here (laughs) why are we why why are we doing this and you uh some of this is fan image but this is an official artwork of link praying in some catholic cathedral which is amazing there was a place called the sanctuary and link to the past as well and uh yeah i mean that's a that's another religious reference, I guess. Um, I guess their attitude is let's just pur- let's just purge anything religious out of this. Or any reference? I, I guess, I, and I guess it makes it a little bit more um, kind of universal to to non uh, Christian players. I, I guess that that would be my my thinking, because um, I mean it is a um, it is a pretty I don't know jarring image to see link praying to jesus first of all is there a jesus in hyrule that's bonkers um but okay my first thought would be is this some kind of like unauthorized zelda game that was only available in christian bookstores you know but see this was all (laughs) this was an official nintendo artwork and it's like where like yeah you have to do some digging to find it i mean i just googled this but um to find the actual official publication of it you got to do a little bit of digging um 
But Link used to have in Zelda one and two a cross on his um on his shield, and you can see that. Um, but I think because it likened him to like crusader mentalities and stuff, they began stopping that. Um, I think even in the cartoon, um, that awful com- cartoon, did you ever see it where Link would say, excuse me, princess? Yeah. <laughs> he would always have the cross on the shield. I thought you were going to talk about CDI. <laughs> oh, no, those are terrible. We don't mention those. <laughs> <laughs> Wand of Gamelon and whatever There's else. Somebody that brings those up, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I think uh, where we start, uh, we're asking about should Zelda or should Link speak, I think. is the... <laughs> Yeah, should Link speak, you know, that's so what's your take, should he? Oh, man, if they want to turn Zelda into a um, a narrative that's like Final Fantasy, then yes, he should. Um, but if they want to keep the story in the hands of the player, you make your own story through exploration and all that kind of stuff, then he should not. Uh, I think it works either way. Um, but there's, there's a lot more room for them to fall apart in a story. If, if he speaks, mm. just cause I don't think Nintendo does that super well. They are masters at gameplay and allowing you a playground to create your own tales. Um, when it comes to story, I, I'm not sure. I was kind of intrigued by that. I've always been intrigued by movies and the games and vice mm-hmm. versa. And, you know, for the longest time, the idea was movies based on games are awful <laughs> why yeah. why even try that well this year's but then the mario that. yeah i mean it's yeah. huge mario yeah. last of us i mean th- these are incredible pieces of, of media um i mean my family started watching last of us because like they yeah. heard it was cool on hbo and i was like oh let me yeah. tell you about this game so <laughs> really good i mean you know i haven't played those those games so i don't have i can't compare it to them yeah yeah. Well, I'll tell you the show. difference. It's fantastic. The biggest difference is, um, I again, I, I'm different from my family because I have first person memories of being Joel and Ellie and going through that game, whereas they watch it in third person, seeing what's happening on the screen. Um, and it's that to me is the most fascinating piece of any of this research. It's like. How do you process media? And that active agency and decision making makes all the difference. I remember when the first Super Mario Brothers movie came out, and as we were talking about this on Twitter a little bit, and I just, you know, in all seriousness, folks, you know, for, mm-hmm. I wanted to know, I wanted to hear from people that played Super Mario, loved it, and mm-hmm. saw the movie. You know, what was your reaction to that? And a lot of people were like, this was just soul crushing. Mm. You know, this was a terrible moment of my life when I saw this this movie. And mm. I just, you know, as a kid, I guess, and just seeing this. <laughs> but other people are like, well, I went back and watched it as an adult. And now I'm like, well, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, Never it's been. just so different than what yeah. you would play tonally. It's so different. Um, and uh, Weird, I mean, I wanted to like it as yeah. like a <laughs> nine or ten year old, year old, and uh, I did like it, but it was different. It was just different take. Well, let's see. We we got. Do you have time for a few a uh, few more questions here? Yeah, please. I got some. Uh, I got some more from uh, Matt Bradley Shergy, and then we got one from uh, Snap Snappy or Snap Snapper. Okay. <laughs> He's very snappy. <laughs> uh, I think this is kind of a fun question. Uh, so, Final Fantasy VII opens out of school. When you became a professor and replayed the game, did you find this section more interesting than when you first played it? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that he's probably talking about Final Fantasy VIII because uh, oh, seven, seven opens on a train, but eight does open in a school. And yes. We'll blame um, Shirgy for that one. Bradley Shirgy. Eight. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, 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 no worries. No worries. Um, but yeah, Final Fantasy VIII does start in a school. And I found that, um, yeah, I, I, I relate more to the headmaster and to the professor in the classroom than the student. And in fact, like the student, um, several of the students are like just beating their head against their desks during the lecture. And I'm like, I know that student. I I know that one. And uh, (laughs) it's like, "Mm." so yeah, it's, it does make you appreciate it more. I also wonder about um, their like um, their insurance and risk management areas in that game. Because like, their departments in that school, it's terrible. Like they're, they're the worst things happen in this school. I'm like, doesn't work. So it changed my perspective when I go back and play it. 
What was the first video game that you felt treated faith or religion in a thoughtful manner? Oh, man. Um, in a thoughtful man manner, um, I would probably... This is an, an old an old one, but the first time I knew that something religious was going on in a game was probably the Super Nintendo game Act Razor. Um, it is the story where you are an angel sent to Earth and you are helping to rebuild a civilization. And um, you have to like clear out demons or again, bring order to chaos. But that is, um, I, I felt like it was a really interesting piece of how does the divine create things? Now, I, when I first played Act Razor, I did not go to church. I Just, wasn't. Yeah, this is it. This is exactly it. I was not in church. I what my family wasn't particularly religious at this point in my life, but I knew that there was something to this. Um, yeah, uh, angel interacting with monsters in the area, shooting with arrows. Um, yeah, the player plays as the master and. Uh, the main protagonist of the game and instead as the master so you really take on the the role of the divine again i never beat this game but i remember renting it again from blockbuster and you have the power of god building a civilization i thought that that was a really really cool thing in fact it says that he's got a fight against satan yeah there's this a lot of a really yeah interesting game Actually. yeah yeah, and it's also got almost like a Sim City component of building a city outside of these side-scrolling things. Yeah, look at this uh, religious subtext down here. Protagonist's oh. name is God in the original Japanese version. Antagonist is uh, Satan. Um, the bosses are based on real-world religion or mythology, such as Greek or Hinduism. Um, concept of religion is explored further at the end of the game when the angel and master discover that the temples of the world have become empty people having lost their concept of faith and need for a deity now that their lives uh, have had all suffering removed um yeah i mean this is i was maybe eight years old playing this game and i was like huh there's a lot of religion in this game um who would have guessed that it would have paved the way for what i do now so i think you get an a plus for this for that answer <laughs> nice thank you um, that was a deep dive i haven't thought of it never say what yeah, this one, it's so intriguing to me this this you know they talk about all these changes between the north american mm. release like what was the science or what was the was there any consistency in this process consistency of removing the religious imagery yeah is that i just wondered well, like yeah, it seemed you know, kind of scattershot and random, random to me when I look at like changes. I, I haven't looked at this one yet, but if I were to guess, if I were to guess, and again, this is you know me kind of thinking back through history and cultural movements, hot on the heels of um, the '60s and the '70s, the um, gamers largely were part of a not only non-religious crowd but kind of a rebellion against uh, religion crowd. And so uh, religion was predominantly kind of located in suburban areas, neighborhoods, whereas people that played video games, um, you know, especially in those early, like 80s, early 90s days, um, they were a bit more niche and stuff. And so to kind of appeal more to a wider audience. Um, I, and I believe that this was Nintendo that did this. Um, and so Nintendo mandated that, I think, um, that a lot of games would censor those sort of religious things. And the idea was Nintendo video games are for everybody. You know, um, I think that if you look at games, I could be wrong about this. If you look at games that were simultaneously released on uh, Super Nintendo and Genesis, religious images may still be in the Genesis um, now I could be wrong about that, but I I think that I've heard that somewhere. Makes a lot of sense, Genesis. Did you, oh, huh, how about that? <laughs> Sega Genesis. How about that? <laughs> it's even in the name of the console. How about that? <laughs> hmm. Oh, fascinating stuff. Yeah. Okay, let's see what else we got here. <laughs> is a, yeah, is a good video game tutorial any different from teaching a class? <sighs> hmm. Is There's a good. There yeah. are similarities. Um, you know, the one thing I noticed about this: a lot of video games, I think, do a better job of scaffolding. 
you know, you, you're familiar yeah. with terms like that from <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> encouraging I, I, people to go beyond the textbook, you know. So, you know, this you can learn a lot from good video game tutorials, I feel like you can. And I, I think that it makes for a better teacher, you know, and I, I think that there's got to be a hook in um, in teaching and in tutorials that compel you to keep going. Um, I, I recently put out a um, a video on side quests and what makes a good side quest. Yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> in in that video, I use uh, the research of... Really great um, video, by the way. Thank you, thank you. I use the research of a guy named John Keller, who's a, who was a professor in um, Florida State, uh, educational theorist. And one of the things that he talks about are that there are four components of attitudinal interest and motivation. And you have to main, uh, you have to get, grab somebody's attention. The content that you're um, teaching has to be relevant to the user. Number three, there has to be some confidence building. They have to begin to believe that they can do what's asked of them. And then ultimately there's gotta be a level of satisfaction. What's the feeling that they get um, upon completing it? Are they thrilled or are they downtrodden? Um, these four things are going to determine whether somebody continues with the task, the lesson, the project, or the game. And um, for me, that's how I design my syllabus. Um, I'm going to say what's grabbing their attention, what is relevant to their lives. That's why I do personal reflections of like, what, how does this game or this content intersect with your life? Um, how am I building confidence, especially for those that aren't gamers? Um, how can I make this easily accessible to them? Um, and so I, I, I do let's play. So I call them lecture plays, right? So they're okay. watching me, but I encourage them to play on their own. So they still get that first person memory, but I'm showing them how to play while I'm, I'm YouTubing or Twitching or whatever it is. So those are, those are key pieces for me. And I think that a tutorial, gosh, I wish all of my teachers in school had played video games and learned the art of the tutorial. Um, because man, they could have used it. Some of them could, especially in math. I was never good at math. I've read some some of these gamification, you know, folks. They're going full in, with like experience points and yeah, <laughs> this whole ungrading movement. Of you, you know, just hearing about that the other day. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, conflicted um, on that one because you know, kind of as a gamer, you know, I like competition and same, same. You know, no. I don't want just. I mean, what could feel worse than like, well, you didn't make it, but here's the. Yeah. You're still gonna. We'll still let you. We'll say you beat the game, even though you really didn't. Right. Have you read the the articles um, recently about um, the grading scale and removing like zero to fifty, trying to move in um, into like they they're saying that it's too large of a grouping for failure there but instead to equalize it a bit um where you've got like the bottom 25 percent of accuracy or skill excellence and then 50 percent, 75 and 100 um but failure is like essentially a zero instead of the first 50 points it's kind of interesting i i don't know i don't know if you're gonna shift the course of the titanic um as quickly as this person wants but well, that's a metaphor for you <laughs> well you know i've often thought it would you know in an ideal world you'd everybody would have an individual tutor yeah and oh yeah. however long it takes you know we'll, if it takes you a year to learn this we'll take a year you know but this yeah, yeah. sort of forcing people into these well you've got six weeks or whatever and if you yeah. don't have it you uh but like you say that's a the titanic moving <laughs> the battleship <It> turning <laughs> yeah any sort of like behemoth how many sure. hundreds and thousands of years have we been kind of doing it this way you know it's... right right yeah. well that that's another piece of this you know education has largely been the same since the the greeks right i mean standing in the forum and um just speaking to the masses and people are taking notes and um today we are finding that the attention of our students is much less you know because they're first of all for the first time in history information truly is available to the masses. Um, there, there's not, even, even literacy is not a barrier anymore because of such educational video content. People are learning in this sort of um, new component at, the, in their, um, at their fingertips with their phones. And so if you can get all of the information just at the, the touch of your phone or your device, 
what is the purpose of higher education? And this is the question that, that I wrestle with. How am I creating experiences that aren't teaching information, but are molding the way that someone thinks about the information? How are they processing this information? Application. Yeah, it's all application. Um, Absolutely. We, we're having all these debates. On, I don't know what it's like where you are, but and there's all exactly. these debates. Something like 60%, I think, last survey I saw of students, they want online only. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's this pushback from professors that, you know, I always think, you know, what kid sits around dreaming about the day I'll be a teacher and get to teach online, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yes, so the teachers want to have the class and the students in front of them and, you know, but is that more effective? Is it less, you know, right. What the students just don't want to do it. Uh, and always come back with, you know, even if you do force people to come to a class, sit there, they're probably looking at their device the whole time anyway. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, where I mean, is what value do we add you know where is the maximum value add yeah uh, that's what i've been searching for well and I, I think for students they're paying for an experience you right. know I, and it's, it's a certainly experience of moving into adulthood but it's also an experience um in a classroom where they're exposed to people that think more deeply than they're currently able to um, mm. because they've never been faced. You're paying for the experience of cognitive dissonance um, that needs to be introduced in every class to some degree. Um, and in some ways that's going to mold you. I think that that determines where you go to school. Um, I always love having somebody from the East or excuse me, the West coast come to the university of Alabama because you're going to get a very different education here than you would at say Claremont or, um, you know, uh, UCLA or something like that. Um, you're, you're learning about a culture as much as anything else. And you don't have to go across the world for that. You can go across the country because it's a very different world in Alabama um, than other places. Um, so for me, like, we all kind of had to do this to some degree in 2020 when our classes went online, um, right? I, I mean, we all learned how to do hybrid courses. Now for me, um, that's how I started Twitch streaming um, because Zoom could not handle the bandwidth of Final Fantasy 15. <laughs> so I was like, well, let's just go on Twitch. And I began to do these lecture plays, but it created lecture an experience plays. for the class. Yeah. Um, and that that's why I do what I do now. Um, I never wanted to be a Twitch streamer. It was a necessity in COVID. Yeah, of course. Now this might be the one two punch that Maybe it does something with the Titanic because we had the, the with COVID, everybody moved into yeah. online and hybrid. But and then shortly now we're like in the midst of this chat GPT. Uh, yes. I mean, every I mean, give me a break. Our, our university is like, no, it's not legal for you to use any of the mm -hmm. uh, uh, AI detection services. Yeah. We like, have a so you know that them. that means, right? So every student. <laughs> You can, oh, I've noticed a sudden improvement, you know, yeah. across hmm. the board. Yeah, yeah, sure you have. Well, especially <laughs> because you can command chat GPT, um, write an essay on these points in the voice of a Harvard master's paper, you know, and it'll do it and go in, make some, some ticks and changes. And the, the thing that I tell my colleagues is we've got to instruct on how to create better prompts um, because AI is going to be a thing of the future, um, like it or not. Um, it's a pocket calculator. Yeah. So what are we doing to help students make the most of that? What are they getting from us that they may not be able to get in the, the regular world? Um, and so you got to build a base of information and knowledge. And then, again, practically, how do you use this knowledge to craft something using these tools? Yeah, I'm just it's just I've been amazed by it, you know, how quickly it seems to be progressing, you know. And oh, every time I hear sense. criticism, like I heard one of my, my colleagues is saying, Well, the thing it'll never do is be able to put a personal experience, you know, personal and so that let's just add this to the prop and see what happens and add some personal experience to it, you know. Yeah, you know, then this I mean, Turing test passed. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. I mean, so we are the the way our institutions run, we are completely um, unprepared for for this, and so we're we're rallying and I'm um, trying to reel. I mean, as a so, student, was I mean, uh, put the unethical stuff aside. Right. I mean, how wonderful would it be, you know, to be in say a calculus class and you're like, I don't understand this concept, and just go to ChatGPT and just keep saying, simplify that. Thank <laughs> okay, you. Even simpler, you know, and eventually get to the level where, oh, now I can start building. Yeah. I get that component. Now we can move on to the next. It's working at your own 
at your pace. I mean, it's, it's almost like having a private tutor. Exactly. And I, I was telling a friend of mine yesterday, I think that chat GPT and these AI generated Im image uh, programs, oh, yeah. these, these are going to create more opportunity for um, uh, individual entrepreneurs and small businesses. Um, because I think that what we're going to see for better or worse is that kind of the impact on the workforce is that like the assembly line did, it's going to take away some of the traditional job forces, but it's going to elevate and make accessible people that have dreams of starting their own company, even for content creators, right? I mean, the, the things that content creators are going to be able to do more efficiently, more cheaply, that's, that was a little bit of game development I've dabbled in. I remember one of the things was I wanted to have a like every game, you know, a menu and a user yeah. interface. And I'm like, well, how do I get some, you know, you, you can download these big packs of buttons. But of course, it never has the one little thing. Right. Of course, it never does. <laughs> that you need. So you're like, OK, what do I need to do? And well, I could pay somebody hundreds of dollars to make this thing. Yeah. So, or, you know, now I can go to chat or whatever the art thing is and just describe it. And boom, there's the button for free. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. you're telling me that's not revolutionary i don't know what is yeah and ethics aside from it i mean that is where things are heading you know and it's like i know that it's putting artists um out out of work making it harder for yeah. them um not even but the artists and even actors and actors uh, uh yeah the ai I know a voice actor recently the, right. the voice of a, a monkey island yeah and it, like this is becoming increasingly becoming a real factor you know it'll never yeah. be as good <laughs> right uh but even if it's good enough when you you think about offering voices for uh just random npcs in towns or side yeah, characters I mean, uh, link's voice could be ai <laughs> yeah it could uh, for, for the amount that he speaks the yeah wow, yeah all that kind of stuff yeah you can do that um i think that they'll still bring in Big names for the the main characters, but yeah, kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is a kind of there's a religious element to it, even. I, mm. I if you've come across any of that stuff or have thoughts on the religious stuff in in what do you mean? I just a well, there's like religions forming around AI. Mm, I think they've I been haven't. around forever, right? But okay, you know, it's like this is the next step in evolution i mean some people really oh, kind of oh uh, yeah like a big singularities and all this kind of stuff i don't sure. know if it's quite the right word for it but you know there's more going on than just a technological uh right breakthrough i don't know how i don't really have an opinion on it but <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've heard mild things it almost reminds me of the matrix <laughs> yeah, the matrix always comes to mind yeah connecting this 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 other larger thing yeah it's all been a god game the whole time. Ah, you knew like that, like Act Razor. Yeah, it's just, just play Act Razor. Just man. everybody play that. Well, let's see. I think we've got. Oh, we haven't done a Snap Snappers question. Okay. I think you'll like this one. Uh, do you think many games do the Arthurian theme justice? They do not need to be an exact retelling of Arthur's story. And if yes, which ones? I don't think any of them do. Um, so I, I mean, the obvious one that comes to mind is Zelda. Um, I mean, in in at least in um, the third Zelda, Link to the Past, all the way to current, there's always that moment of pulling the sword from the stone, um, and that is a symbol of power, of anointing, of um, of hope, um, mm -hmm. and it kind of makes him the hero. And so I think of that. I think that one does it. At least that part of the Arthur story really well. I think other times you're going to get um, allusions to Merlin. I think that, um, I think that, that yeah, right. <laughs> um, I look and, a little bit like King Arthur in that. Eh? It is. Yeah. 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 Um, Good name of the actor. Anyway, I think <laughs> that um, I, I've yet to see a game that really dug into these Arthurian legends uh, quite as well um as as like the original there's not been a one-to-one -one, um sort of thing um though you'd certainly see it anytime you see a love triangle right you've got like the guinevere arthur lancelot thing especially when it's like a close friend um but um yeah I, 
That's surprising too, because it, it seemed like just natural fodder for you would think so many okay. different versions and incarnations of all the characters. And, and there probably is one, but Arthur is so you've got so many different eras of Arthur, right? You've got the um the uh the early Arthur, the childhood Arthur, kind of sword in the stone stuff, and then you've got kind of the Arthur's reign, the peaceful kingdom, um, and the adventures of the knights. Um and then you've got the the downfall of Arthur. And I don't know if a game really embodies all three of those well. Um, I could maybe get on board with um, maybe Fire Emblem in some ways, um, especially with some of the new games, because you're all kind of at this school and individual characters are going off to do different um tasks like the knights of king arthur but I, I would say that's a stretch it's just kind of like the the archetype of what an arthurian legend would be so yeah oh this is the first fire emblem now this is it might be a little bit of rpg simulation or arthur here the genealogy of the holy war yeah the newer ones definitely have that element of um sending off your knights to go and do side quests. Um, huh. Yeah. Fire Emblem's a really interesting series. Have you ever played one? No, I'm, I'm, the more I talk to you, the more I feel like I don't know anything. We just come from very different um, gaming backgrounds, I think. Oh, oh okay. Fire Emblem. Uh, yeah. So this it's... one is Japanese role playing game, 1990. Yeah. But the latest one is Fire Emblem Engage. I think the last one I played was Three Houses. Um, and it was for the Switch, uh, Nintendo Switch. It was really good. <clears throat> good night. Yeah. Got it's your, a fun one. I have to add that to my bibliography. Game bibliography. <laughs> All right. Well, we cover a lot of ground here. Boy, didn't we? Uh, you want to you wanna do one more, I think, just to kind of wrap up? Come on. So what new RPG series, or maybe we should say JRPG series, do you shows the most promise? Is there anything you're really looking forward to on the horizon? Mm. Shows the most promise. Um, that's, you know, I, I think that I always go to the staples, right? The Final Fantasies, all that kind of stuff, but something new. Um, I've really been taken with the Xenoblade Chronicles mm -hmm. series over the last couple of years. Uh, so I don't know if it's like showing promise. It, it's just been really good because there's three iterations, I think, is uh, Chronicles 1, 2, and 3. Um, I haven't finished three. Um, another one that I really like, and this one just got some DLC released, um, is called Tales of Arise. It's part of the Tales series. But Tales of Arise, I think, has one of the most interesting stories and battle systems that's out there right now. Um, other JRPGs on the horizon. Um, oh, yeah, this is it. Tales of Arise. This is such a fun oh, one. It's got this sure. charming anime uh, kind of style to it. This was a great game. Um, and I hope that they continue with a style like this in the future really really loved this um oh there's a demo out yeah that's worth it the battle system's super fun super fun it's like a hybrid of action and um not really turn based but it's much more action i guess and menu based um yeah, really, i don't really think fun. you can actually see the interface on this mm -hmm. yeah i guess they took that away the interface isn't bad i don't know why they took it away it's not even very cumbersome uh also octopath traveler um that is a retro uh styled rpg that is um modern i mean incredible music uh it is turn-based battle but it is uh essentially you've got eight different characters and you see this kind of super nintendo style graphically yeah um oh, it is beautiful kind of a what is it uh hd 2d or uh 3d 2d is what they call it something like that the second one is the one that was released this year, and I'm really excited to play that, hopefully over the holidays. I've got a lot of backlog over the holidays, um, but they really, really love it. Dream come true. Yeah, yeah. 
So you know what we should do, uh, since you haven't played Baldur's Gate three, you know, you should play that. And then you should pick the what what do you think I should play? <laughs> oh man. Um what yeah, what is the you said of Final Fantasy Seven remake? Is that the... I would say seven remake just because like there's a lot of hype around it right now because the sequel to it, Seven Rebirth, comes out February 29th. Um so um seven remake may be a bit of a commitment because it will be three games by the time it's all done. Um, but oh man. I would say seven remake is the um the the like i don't know it's the opus of the final fantasy uh universe right now now let me this is it seven remake intergrade yeah this is the this is like the um complete edition it's got dlc in it and stuff but it is phenomenal i mean just a wonderful game phenomenal voice acting great music um compelling battle system memorable characters um i i adore this game um and uh rebirth is is gonna just take this to 11 i mean it's so so good Re- this is less open world rebirth mine well um, uh, meanwhile is going to be more open world and so that's really exciting also final fantasy 16 which is what i'm playing through on my lecture plays doing a philosophy of religion chapter by chapter that game is phenomenal if you like uh kind of more mature themes 16 is just amazing um one of the best vocal uh voice actor performances i've ever heard a guy named ben Starr, um incredible guy just a phenomenal voice actor in final fantasy 16 it is the m rated final fantasy and it's wonderful now it is a bit more action based um is it available on uh... oh i don't it's not available on steam nope it's ps5 exclusive for now there will be one on pc eventually Wow. I forgot that they were. It was a timed release on PS5. Yeah, that says a lot, though. Sixteen. <laughs> we're talking. I mean, I don't know when they're going to stop. I, I, you would think that they would eventually go Final Fantasy and then like a subtitle, but no, they are committed to the bit of the Roman numerals at this point. <laughs> I mean, it gets hard for me to f- figure out sixteen. Okay, that's like. X X V I I learned Roman numerals from Final Fantasy as a kid. So I can do up to twelve. Yeah. <laughs> it gets it gets hairy when you start adding others. When you add L's and C's, that's when it loses me. Yeah, you watch an old movie and it's like, when did this come out? L C X L C X right O P. Just put the numbers. We're not Roman. Let's do that. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Oh, wow. Well, anyway, we've been at this for a while. We should probably get going. But yeah, yeah, yeah this has been awesome chat. Good meeting you. It's been great. It's been so fun. Nice to meet you. Yeah, folks, head over to Prof Noctus uh, YouTube, and I think it's the same on Twitch. It is. Is YouTube, there a, we have a preference? I mean, is there some more going on on the Twitch or the YouTube? Um, YouTube has all the archives. And so if you want to see the old philosophy of religion or any of the lecture plays that I've done, um head over there but if you like to watch live the twitch chat is usually really really lively um so um twitch.tv slash prof not this but you can really always like, find me on this thing folks that's a, a good start i, <laughs> I think it's interesting so yeah may, may ask <laughs> may answer a question no one's asking but i felt like it was <laughs> i can learn about what the uh what, anyway uh thanks a lot it's been fun yeah get uh, uh, Send me an update on that book when that gets a little I will, I will. Yeah. All right, well, have a good uh, Thanksgiving. Yeah, you as well. And that's all for this week's episode. (laughs) Hope you guys enjoyed that. (laughs) Should be uh, back soon with another one. Got a lot of uh, great interviews lined up, thanks to Matt Bradley Shergi. Uh, who, by the way, uh, redesigned the credits that you'll see at the end of the episode. So thank you to Matt for that. Uh, but most of all, thank you to you. Yes, thank you for keeping Matt Chat on the air, for keeping these episodes coming. Do you like uh, chats with people like Prof Noctis? Then support the show. You know what? I know you want to. It's so easy. <laughs> There's a little link in the uh, show notes. You just clicky-clicky on the little link. Go to the thing called Patreon. 
uh, become a ratrion because we like to slaughter rats here by the dozen at the very least and i'd like to have you on the team so just go uh, pop over there it takes a few minutes it's easy satisfying you like the show 10 times better if you're part of the crew so uh, get that done and come back and we'll finish up with the news from the vet cave <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's got a lot of great news here. See, I think, I think pretty much everybody's on deck here from the uh, Matt Chat Discord channel. Uh, let's see, Tired Gaming Dad. Uh, first off, a huge thank you for your patience and ongoing support. We're super excited to let you know that our much-anticipated game, Zoria Age of Shattering, is set to officially launch on March 7th, 2024. Now, if you haven't been uh, tracking this game, it's a squad-based tactical RPG with fluid turn-based combat, outpost and followers management set in the expensive, or expansive, maybe it is expensive, <laughs> uh, fantasy world of Zoria. Lead a team of four heroes with unique skills and perks every team member contributes. Uh, this is from Tiny Trinket Games, based in Bucharest, Romania. Well, that's a new one. <laughs> Romania, yes. A passionate group of Romanians with a rich background in all aspects of game dev. And a fancy for old school gameplay. Go download the demo. And then Lobsterminator. <laughs> I love these names. <laughs> Snap Snapper, Lobsterminator. Uh, anyway, what's the Lobsterminator? Uh, what's he got it here? 1989 DOS game. Okay, got my attention. Uh, it was originally released in a buggy state. Got a bug fix release 35 years later. <laughs> that took a little while, uh, uh, but it's here. Starfleet 2, Krellen Commander version 2.0. Welcome to the future of space warfare. This looks uh, really fantastic uh, if you're a fan of this era. Uh, let's see, the 2.0 version, what does it do? Improves AI, improves UI. Bug fixes galore, quality of life enhancements. Improve key commands, new features such as beaming prisoners into stars. Beaming prisoners into stars, okay. Uh, ship performance data, new overlays, and probe operations. <laughs> oh, you had me at probe operations. I'm going to check this out. Only $9.99. I believe it's on sale, so check that out. Thank you to Lobstermination. Uh, Lobsterminator. I guess that's what he engages in. <laughs> Lobstermination. <laughs> Got a lobster problem. Yeah, I know a guy. Uh, okay, Miko. Yes, Miko. That Miko writes, uh, writes in about Chronicles of... Oh, boy. Valtaja. V-A-E-L-T-A-J-A. -A -A. Valtaja. Valtaja. Maybe they should pick a name that's a little easier to figure out. But anyway, uh, In Search of the Great Wanderer. This is a fantasy grid-based dungeon crawler role-playing game set in the kingdom of Twin Falls. A lush and colorful world created with beautiful pixel graphics. Yes, they are, if you do say so yourself. And it takes you back to the golden age of PC gaming when role-playing games like Dungeon Master, Might and Magic, Eye of the Beholder, Lands of Lore, Wizardry, and Ultima ruled the world. <laughs> uh, really good games. You know, have I covered all the lands of lore on this on this show? I don't know if I've. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did the first one. And if the other ones are a hoot as well, of course I've done Eye of the Beholder. Uh, let's see. Anyway, back to Valdeja, Valtaja, 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 whatever we want to call this. Uh, gather your party of six adventurers. Ah, so they've got not four but six. Yeah. Like a big old party. Uh, embark on your journey through the colorful kingdom of Twin Falls, where sunny fields, lush forests, misty swamps, and dark dungeons await to be explored. Currently in early access for fifteen twenty nine. All right, so I think that will do it for the news. So thank you to Miko Lobsterminator and Tired Gaming Dad. Uh, all right, so uh, let's see. I do have a, a little something for you here. A cowbell. <laughs> You know, I heard that every, uh, you know, every, uh, uh, every video I think would benefit from a little more cowbell. <laughs> I actually got this, uh, I was rewatching the SNL skit and it's just so, it's just such a fabulous skit. It's one of my favorites. It's one of my, about one of my favorite, actually I'll say my favorite band, Blue Oyster Cult. I know the skit's about them with the cowbell, but uh, anyway, I just kind of got this for fun, but 
Now, I was going to show it to you because I had this uh, simplistic notion of a cowbell. You know, I thought it was just, you know, not, nothing to it, no musical uh, ability required. You know, it's just you're beating on this thing. But uh, I've really been amazed at all the different sounds you can get out of a, a simple cowbell like this. It's, uh, you know, if you hold it really tight like this, you get kind of a, kind of like a metal plate sound. Or you can hold it like this and, you know, get a sort of bell bunging sound. You can rattle it like this. I mean, there's, there's a, I mean, what can you not do with this? I'm pretty sure if you practiced enough with this, you could, uh, you know, even do a song like Don't Fear the Reaper. <laughs> anyway, I just thought this was fun. Uh, yes, uh, you know, if you're looking for a fun little gift for somebody, it's not expensive. And I think you can, uh, uh, you know, how can you resist playing with a cowbell? Uh, but there it is. I think I paid, a, I want to say that was $25. I got the biggest one. I was thinking about seeing uh, what all I might do that. If I can incorporate it some way into some future videos, maybe. Uh, who knows? We'll see. Uh, but I dare say, <laughs> not that hard to learn how to play, and you can have a lot of fun. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, so I was looking for quotes about religion, and there have been a few. But <laughs> I think this, is, this might be one of my favorites. Um, I'll uh, read the quote. There was a, a little text there. Okay. Uh, back to the quote. And that was not God texting. <laughs> uh, anyway, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, had a little something to say about religion. It goes something like this. Religion is what keeps the poor from murdering the rich. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. Assembling a plan? Uh, Roger will find them, kill them all. <laughs>